Okay, hello, I'm Ryan. I'm going to talk about the lessons my team and I learned after six months with Expo and React Native. So let's talk about Expo. So who has done React Native here? A little bit, a little bit of React Native. So React Native lets you build real iOS and Android applications using mostly just plain JavaScript uh, and React. I guess that's plain JavaScript. Um, that's cool, but and sometimes you can also add in native modules. You can write some Objective-C or some Swift or some Java, and then you can plug those two things together and you can get a pretty cool app where the most part is just JavaScript. So Expo is sort of a platform add-on that lets you actually condense that down into just JavaScript. So there are some limitations of that, though. So Expo likes to claim that it's the fastest way to build an app, and I think every tool out there says that these days. Um, but there are some cool things, and so we'll go over some pros of Expo. So it allows us to just avoid all the native code. We don't get to write any. We don't want to write any. Don't tell us about the native code. Uh, it has a, a ton of native bridges, though. So not everything we want to do is something you can do in JavaScript. Sometimes you need to get location data. Sometimes you need to do push notifications. Sometimes you need to get to the file system. Expo can give you all of those tools. You just go through their API instead of writing your own Swift code or Android. Is that Java? Do people still use that? Um, so Expo also has some really cool things, and it sort of gets you closer to web development. So if you've ever enjoyed using the React hot reload pattern where you just type some stuff, hit save, and bam, it's just there in your browser. You can do that now with a mobile app, and it's really nice. And you can also push builds over the air without having to go through the App Store review process, sort of. Um, there are a few weird little things, but for the most part, you can just update your live apps whenever you want, which is really nice. There are cons. There are always cons to these things. Uh, you can't use native code. So one of the things that React Native developers will often do is use React Native Link, which allows you to bring in a third-party component or library that uses native code that has a pre-built Android or Swift thing ready to go. You can't do that. So it's just limited to aliens, I mean pure JavaScript, um, which is somewhat of a limitation, but it's also really nice because you get to work with what you're familiar with, and it's just simple. Um, but a ten-pole feature was recently removed, so one of the things that Expo lets you do is just take your phone, scan a QR code, and you just get to use the app. It's just super simple. Um, but they recently took that away on iOS because Apps to Review said, no, you can't do that anymore. So it's cool to use Expo, but now you have to depend on this third-party service for even pushing code out to the app stores. So that's kind of, kind of scary in a way. So let's talk about React and React Native a little bit. So these are some of my favorite things. You've probably all seen these things uh, in the React ecosystem. One of my favorite things, though, among my favorite things, is Prettier. Everybody should love Prettier, embrace Prettier. Um, it also reminds me of PHP. Any PHP fans out there? One. We got one. We got two. Okay. So some of the not so great things about React is verbosity about Redux. Like there's just so many things when you do Redux code, um, and it, you kind of you kind of just get spaghetti code. There's just reducers and selectors and actions everywhere. Also, it kind of looks like PHP sometimes, and that's <laughs> that's really bad. Um, the tooling, of course, is really familiar. familiar. Mm -hmm. It's not Webpack, but it sort of acts like Webpack. It's the Metro compiler. It uses Babel for the latest ECMAScript. You know, you can do all your async awaits you want. Um, it's effectively all JavaScript. There's a few configuration files. OK, there might be a lot. Um, it has direct interop with all your favorite tools, like Prettier, Prettier uh, and ESLint. Um, and it also gets you access to the debugger. You can debug just like plain JavaScript. You can debug right in VS Code. It's really nice. And here are the files. They're just everywhere. There's just so many files. Um, and it's really cool. Like, you get to explore your, pro your design space, and then you get to incrementally build it. And it's just so much faster to do this in JavaScript instead of having to sit down and write two versions, one for iOS and then another one for Android. So let's talk about styling, because look and feel is super important when you're making you know, an app for a phone. So styling in React Native has some pros and cons. So it's almost CSS. You get to use all your favorite CSS properties. You don't, uh, you do, you don't get to use snake case or um, kebab case. You have to use camel case. It's very sad. 
Um, you get Flexbox, though. In fact, Flexbox is the only way to style the layout and the alignment of things. Um, and you get basically component scope styles. So this has been a really big thing in the ecosystem on the website, and so this is how it is on the native side too for React Native. Now there are cons though, and one of those cons is poor cross-component theming. And so what that means is there is no pattern established by the React Native team from Facebook on how to achieve components actually working together and drawing from a common inheritable pattern for getting styles to sort of cascade. Speaking of cascade, there's no cascade. That's, a, that's one of those problems. Um, there's just confusion in general about where to put styles. Is it a global style? Should it go in some global file called colors? Should it be a component style that's called light gray 2? Or is it inline where you don't give it a name at all, but now you have to change light gray EF, EF, EF 16 times? It's great. So we used a really nice components library called native base. And uh, I'm surprised here that they don't say this is the easiest way to build a native application. Um, <laughs> so there's some pros and cons. So this is one of the few major component libraries for React Native right now. Um, it helps you bootstrap really well. It can get a ton of nice UI screens, buttons, sliders, tabs, all, you name it. Really good. Basic components ready to go. Here are the cons. It's difficult to port themes. So when you get the package, when you get your native base installed, you have to go through all of its styles and colors and things to adapt it to your app. That's kind of like dealing with all of those SAS variables when you do this with Bootstrap. But it's just worse, because it's not Bootstrap. Uh, there's a limited set of components. It's not universal. If Facebook had actually established with React Native a theming system, we could just download anybody's code that used the same theming system. We could just use the styles that they provided, and we could just turn them on and turn them off, do whatever we needed. You can't do that with native base. It doesn't interop with anything, so you have to go get your own styles and get lucky enough to be able to style them the same way as native base does, or get rid of the native base styles altogether. It lags behind modern React practices, so component uh, or uh, component will see, receive props. You know that's going away. Is everybody familiar with that? Well, guess what? Native base uses it everywhere. Just, it's great. Um, and it's just kind of poorly coded, and it's, it has limited flexibility. There's a bunch of assumptions. So pros and cons. We also use this other thing. It's called React Native Router v4. This has nothing to do, coincidentally, with React Router v4. We just stick the word native in there, and it turns out it's a different library. So this one has pros and cons. So we're thinking, why didn't we use React Navigation, which is the standard? for React Native navigation. Well, we used a template, and the template had this in it, so we used it. Um, so it's really cool because it's declarative like Ra React Router v4. You know, you get, you get to hit describe your routes in component form, which is great. But it's probably not best practice, and so some things are missing. The docs aren't super good. It's serviceable, but you know, it could be better. OK, let's talk about testing. I know what you're thinking. We actually did write tests. So we use something called Browser Stack. It's, more for, it's not just for browsers. It's OK. It also can do um, automated app testing. And it's pretty cool, because you get to run it through your CI CD pipeline. So you don't have to have all of this stuff necessarily running on your own computer, your own machines. Um, what's really cool is that it lets you test on real physical devices out in the cloud somewhere. And then it'll record a video and show it to you after, or it'll just fail, and you won't care. Um, you just hit you know, publish anyway. Um, so you can test on a Pixel 2, an S8. You can test on a bunch of different phones. It's really nice. It's, it's only limited to Android, though. So mm. um, the bad part is the just ton of inconsistencies. So for example, we're running an end-to-end -end test, and we're trying to click through our app, click all the buttons, click all the buttons, fill out the forms. Suddenly, Google crashes. Well, our end-to-end -end tests are coded to click buttons in our app, not the dismiss Google crashing prompt. So that's a problem. So of course, everybody uses Jest. Jest is our test runner. And you know, what do we want to test besides end-to-end -end work? Well, component tests. So did something render as expected? This is what snapshot testing in Jest does. That's good. Unit tests, these are my favorite because they're simple to write. They're really easy, especially when you write pure functions that you can put stuff into and get stuff out of. There are no side effects. It's simple. 
And then my second favorite test, I guess, are these dirty functional tests. And this is actually um, where I think a lot of our testing sort of is. And it's sort of this gray line between unit testing and functional testing and integration testing. So we use something called reselect. And it is, it's a selector library that helps us cut across our Redux store, which is cool. So it lets you derive uh, state and aggregate data from that store. And it's cool because it helps you uh, test what feeds the UI in terms of data, which is really nice because then you can just have a unit-like test. You can just code your selector, code your test, see if it's the way you want it, and you can just go from there. You don't have to make a whole UI before you get the time to play with your data, which is really nice. Okay, that's it. That was six months. I did it. You did it. <laughs> Any questions? No questions. Very good. You're all React Native experts now. Oh, question. Yeah, so uh, if you build an app on Expo, how do you distribute it? Okay, so here's what happens. Expo will let you build APKs and IPAs um, using their service. So you don't build any of those things with your local computer. You issue an expo command on your computer and it'll take all your source code, bundle it up, send it to their servers, and 25 minutes later it'll pop out two links, one for the IPA, one for the uh, APK. And then you can upload those to the store manually if you're not cool or if you're super cool you can have some continuous deployment do the sort of that automated for you. Yeah. Question. So how can you Oh man, it's super cool. So it turns out all of this JavaScript code is still JavaScript code after it gets into the bundle in the app that gets distributed to the stores. So what it actually does is it checks a server, a CloudFront server or something, and it will re-download this JavaScript bundle over time and it you know, checks whenever app startup is. So over time you can just update the bundle and as long as the permissions of the app don't change or some native code, whatever that is, doesn't change, you're okay. I think there was a question over there. Um, at any point, have you had to reset Expo? Because you guys have to do it uh, We've come close a few times, but we have successfully not done it. <laughs> All right. Thanks, Ryan. Thank you. Thank you.